Next, we have Andreas now to look uh, very literally at biology needs and, and A to D to do molecular to biological information transduction and to talk about that, Andreas. Thanks. Uh, I'm very happy to be here and uh, I'm, I'm really excited by what I just heard from uh, uh, Tom and uh, Rahul and uh, Manolis. It sounds like I don't have to do that much because we, we're, we, we're talking about the same stuff, only my system that I'm going to describe to you today has to do with biomolecular recognition. And as an example, I use olfaction. And it turns out olfaction is the biggest mess you can have. And that turns out to be good because if you can solve that, I will argue that you can also solve um, pharma. So um, one thing that I noticed from the last three talks, and it will appear in mine too, is that we spoke about recognition of sites in the genome. We spoke about uh, things coming together, which we know are molecules that are doing some physics and some chemistry to tell uh, where they need to be and what they need to do. And yet, we didn't see much about the structure. We didn't see many X-ray crystallography pictures. We didn't see many little dots where we have to do the inverse Fourier transform to figure out where every atom is and from the electron density. It sounds like even if those things didn't exist, somehow everything the last three speakers st spoke about would have been unaffected. And um, we'll see how that plays out. So in our quest to understand um, biomolecular recognition, we built some noses, and we also um, did some molecular dynamic simulations, and uh, we did some information theory. And a little bit of um, background on what it means to biomolecular recognize. It is on a spectrum. It's not a... Uh, it's not the same mechanism for everything that you want. In the general rule is, if the thing that's recognizing something else is easy to crystallize, and those were the ones that were crystallized early on, then you're sort of in the mousetrap-like regime. The mousetrap-like regime is the kind of bimolecular system where knowing the state with the mouse in it and the state with the mouse out of it is pretty good and very useful, and you can connect the dots and see how the mechanism works for the mousetrap. Now, at the very other end of the spectrum, um, somewhere here, the very other end of the spectrum, we have what we call the accordion regime. The accordion regime doesn't really tell you very much if you see it in one state and the other, because it has all these little keys and it has all these little buttons that will set the tone and they will set the music, and you really have to see it move and you really have to have it uh, in a movie uh, in order to understand what the mechanisms are. And you won't get very much information from just taking better and better higher resolution, megapixel pictures, X-ray, crystallographic evidence, TEM, and whatnot of the accordion, you will not know what the thing is for or what it's doing or what its purpose is and why you find it in these different states. Now, Nobel Prizes were given, of course, for uh, the mousetrap end of the spectrum, and correctly so, uh, because it was uh, fantastically important to understand, for, for instance, a poster child is the potassium channel. That thing is very, very, very tight and very mouse-like, tra uh, mousetrap-like. Uh, another good example is uh, hemoglobin. And knowing the egg atomic structure to atomic precision of hemoglobin explains the mechanism very well of how it works to transport oxygen. And then we go to rhodopsin. Uh, Gobin Karana got shared the Nobel Prize for understanding how rhodopsin works. And um, it was a little bit difficult to crystallize, but rhodopsin is the easiest to crystallize of a family of sensors called the GPCRs, G-protein coupled receptors. They are a very large family. There's um, over a thousand of them uh, in the human genome. They account for about a third of the human, uh, one, sorry, they account for about 3% of the human genome. And about half of those, sorry, about 800 total GPCRs so far, but half of those are olfactory receptors. We have a, couple, a few rhodopsins and a couple others, including the a beta genetic, a genetic receptor, which was uh, awarded the um, 2012 uh, Nobel Prize. So what happens is rhodopsin is nice and robust, and it will actually make a two-dimensional film that will not do a Bragg diffraction, but will be stable and will be operational at 140 C. This is above boiling. And it crystallizes relatively easily, and it has its ligand, the little molecule that its um, brethren would need to be recognizing. In the case of rhodopsin, it's bound there forever and it has changed from a system that recognizes small molecules into a system that recognizes light. The same downstream everything, same seven transmembrane uh, domains that we see everywhere, the hydrophobic transmembrane, alpha helices, 
These are common to everything. The same downstream signaling with the G protein and the other uh, cascade. And uh, the antennas are tuned to uh, red, green, and blue. And there's a very interesting story about how that whole system gives you essentially color vision with a discrimination between color and, and intensity of about a million. You can get about a million um, different colors that your eyes can tell. And uh, that's like saying you can do one in a 20, one twenty-five thousandth or whatever of a nanometer, uh, which sounds like you shouldn't be able to do that on photons that go between 400 and 800 nanometers using a protein that's five nanometers across and also is jiggling in this thermal noise all the time. Well, in any case, uh, rhodopsin was crystallized, the structure was solved, we understood how it works, but not really anything about uh, how the next one works. So beta genetic receptor, which is more wiggly, less crystal-like, harder to crystallize, the, the, it took forever, and the reason that it finally managed uh, to get crystallized and the structure was sold is because they specifically developed a technology to bind its legs together so it stopped wiggling. Now, that should tell you something. If the thing is so hard to crystallize and it needs to wiggle so much in its natural state, then when you, when you force it to crystallize by stopping it from doing that, you're probably getting an artifact in the structure. So sure enough, we, that was sold, and uh, um, then we think that we understand how the ligand is sterically inhibited and sticks there very well, and we can see all the connections um, to the various amino acids and the residues that recognize it. And this is a case where the ligand is very uh, well known, and there's not that many other ligands that will bind to be the beta-2 adrenergic receptor. And yet still, it has several different pathways by which it fires. We now keep finding out that it has agonists, partial agonists, reverse agonists, reverse antagonists. What is a reverse antagonist? There's about nine different ways that this thing can, can be activated. Somewhere in between the beta adrenergic receptor and uh, a billion dollars later, the uh, perfume industry is all of pharma, and they're all GPCRs. Uh, more than 50% of the targets right now in pharmaceutical discovery efforts have to do with, let's find a molecule that will activate my GPCR. I can find molecules that will stick to it, but I can't really uh, easily tell you what will activate. Olfaction is the worst. There, everything is super flimsy, super promiscuous, we call it. Many receptors will bind to many molecules. Many molecules will bind to the same receptor, many different activation ways. And yet, it is so selective and so precise. Just to give you a sense of how messy this is, this is uh, we had to remove some of the jiggles here, because you, all you'd see is a blur. So the membrane is jiggling. This is in thermal noise and in water. These are our odorants. These are the molecules that carry scent. They are wiggling. They are conformationally labile. They uh, will go through a 90-degree uh, uh, kink. And one of them will diffuse into the hydrophobic pocket and tumble there. And again, we had to lower the jiggleness so you can see something. But, but this thing is a blur. All that happens after the molecule has fallen in, if it, find, if it is the specific one that activates the receptor, the blur gets a little bit less. We'll lose some of the conformational uncertainty in both the ligand and the receptor. And even now, you can see now the ligand has a, uh, has a preferred way to, uh, to appear inside the pocket, like this, while before it could, it could be doing other things. And the reason that we know this is from molecular dynamic simulations. And it turns out that's black magic, because I could put it in a different way, and it would have appeared a different way, and I would have said, hey, but that predicts my experiment, so I'm good. So how does this jiggling mess do all these interesting things? How does it know to tell me that all these very different shaped molecules all smell of musk? We have no two molecules that we cannot learn. If you find any two molecules that have a scent, you will be guaranteed to eventually be able to learn to tell them apart. But we can always also be able to tell the molecules that smell similar, and we can agree upon it. It's uh, our nose is an objective measure. How does, where does it say in here that this should be a pear and this should be a banana, and everybody should agree that one extra carbon atom gives you that difference? How do we tell geometric isomers? In some work that we did, we showed that we can train Drosophila flies to identify singly deuterated uh, isotopes and then transfer that training to fool them, to misidentify another molecule that all, the only thing that it shared with the, deuterium, um, the deuterated isotope that it was, um, the, you know, the flies were trained on was the vibrational peak, which was 850 centi inverse centimeters away from where it was before. So the information transfers, somehow these things can tell you a vibrational peak we, in this jiggly noise without any noise isolation, without any fancy FTIR or uh, you know, cryogenic temperatures. In fact, this was actually confirmed also now in bees. Uh, and we can tell enantiomers. And another interesting thing, the limit of detection 
is the same as the limit of recognition for every odorant. That means that in this room, you would, if you heard me whisper, you may know that I'm whispering, but you don't, you don't know what I'm saying. I have to increase the volume so you can tell what I'm saying. You can tell noise, and then you can tell meaning. The nose, as soon as you hear it, you know what it is. There is no transition between limit of detection and limit of recognition. So that's interesting. It is versatility of the nose as a system, coupled to the brain, is immense. You can train a dog to find a rose, and it will find you another rose in the flower store, in all the noise, and it doesn't have to be the same species of rose. It can generalize to rosiness. And you can train a dog to find cancer in bladder cancer uh, patients by smelling their urine, and the dog will generalize, some dogs will, and spontaneously trigger on skin cancer. They manage to figure out what's cancery about some scent. There is, um, well, this is, I actually added it while, while people were talking to show you what the, uh, how the information gets organized. And this is um, how you can detect different numbers, e or even or odd numbers of carbons. And this is the uh, uh, activation of the neuron now, uh, downstream. And um, remarkably, you can make mixtures that smell similar even though they don't share any components. So all these things caused us to be very interested in this and wanted to, to try and figure things out. And the first thing that we did was we followed Feynman and we said, well, if we don't understand it, let's build one. So we tried building a nose, and we did, using olfactory receptors. And as from the very beginning, we started getting very surprised by things we found. First of all, we found that human olfactory receptors, being membrane proteins, are very stable. Everybody thought as soon as you take them out of the membrane, they will decompose, they will stop functioning. So they, they, they survive very well, and we have to encase them in hydrogels, but they do. This really surprised us. The specificity in the machine that looks like a box about this big, and it's all electronic circuits, and it's a fetal affection resistor, has nothing to, doesn't even have the G protein downstream, doesn't have any membrane. The specificity in the cross-assay environment is retained. Now, that, that should not happen. I mean, we were thinking that we will be happy because these things will be selectively sticky and we'll make a panel, but it's somehow the same odorant that activates a receptor in the nose of a human or a mouse will activate that same receptor when I put it in my machine and that, my receptor has never been in the side of a cell because I did it in cell-free expression. Uh, so, um, the last interesting thing was that when we tried to understand how to encode these scents now, because this is the only machine in the world that was designed to tell you what something smells of versus what something's made of. It's not an analytical tool. It doesn't know how many odorants are in a mixture. It doesn't care, just like the dog. The dog knows when something smells of a rose. It doesn't know how many odorants go to make it. So uh, most of you don't know how many odorants there are, for instance, in a coffee. Coffee, is it one or is it 802? Which one is, how, what, is it the mixture that gives you the characteristic scent of coffee or not? So um, what we found that we had to do here was make uh, a cascade of experiments. So the first board does a rough approximation of what is this and what kind of scent it is, and it communicates with the next board while the odorants are flying what kind of experiment to do. So we reduce the phase space by two every time, and uh, sort of like an A to D converter. Now, uh, there's many fun facts about these things, but a lot of people covered the fact that these things look a lot like um, a bunch of uh, analog computers. There's all these s curves everywhere. And um, I guess my favorite thing, I guess my favorite thing is that the one thing that's conserved, whether you're detecting photons or ligands or odorants or pain or touch or taste or heat, is these seven transmembrane domains. And nobody knows why. Thermodynamically, these things are not really uh, very fun to look at because uh, I'm putting up the slide to show you that they're all over the place. But logically, if you look at them as a logic operation of information theory, we know that they can flip up to about 12 Landauer bits from uh, certain considerations. We have developed some equations. And what we've done, this I'll finish on this. What we've done here is we found out that, uh, let me go through this data because it's actually fun. Here's an S-curve, they're everywhere. This is the activation of a cell that is expressing only one receptor. To eugenol, this is its specific odorant, it goes like this. The EC50 is about, oh, I don't know, maybe 60 or 70 or something like this, uh, in micromolar. If you mutate this uh, leucine, 259 into valine 259, suddenly the sensitivity to this molecule is moved by a factor of 10. This is a log curve. The same can be affected by changing the molecule, keeping the receptor the same. So it looks like this molecule, creosol, is like 10 cents 
Eugenol is like a dollar coin, and the thing doesn't care how you present it to it. If you give it 10 of these guys, it will be interpreting it as a dollar, same as if you give it one of these guys. And you can affect that both ways. You can play with the utterance, or you can play with the mutation. So we now have this lookup table back and forth, and we're trying to solve the code in the nose. Uh, we've been successful in identifying the first uh, switch that the odorant must flip, and uh, we think we know how that works. And um, I'm going to leave you with just this one observation. When the membrane receptors were first uh, postulated, and uh, Robert Lefkowitz, who later got the Nobel Prize for studying them, went to his advisor and said, I'm going to do this, he was laughed at because people thought that the receptors, membrane receptors, were sort of like quarks, like Jill Mann thought about the quarks in the beginning. They're mathematical abstractions that are useful in understanding the information of how does the cell respond to the environment, but they don't really exist. They're not actual, there's no molecular thing that does it. There's no physics or chemistry. Nowadays, every time you talk about pharma, people say, oh yeah, if only, since structure determines function, if only we had more structures, better structures, we'd be able to tell you how to design better drugs. Well, guess what? It turns out that if we never found the GPCRs, all of what I just spoke about, and all the last three uh, speakers spoke about, would have been the same. Nothing would have been changed. All we need, it looks like, is a transcriptome and the metabolome, or in the case of olfaction, the palate that, uh, of odorants that are coming in. And if we can show that this is enough for us to predict what something smells of, what a molecule will smell of, which nobody can do, then it will definitely be enough for pharma, because pharma GPCRs are easier than olfaction GPCRs, because olfaction is the biggest mess, and yet we don't need to look, and we can't even look at those structures, and it looks like we don't need to. So, thanks.